All right, hello everybody and welcome to this webinar in the introduction to digital literacy with Dr. Jane Secker. Um, Jane is going to give us a nice overview of what digital literacy means and how it's different from other literacy such as information literacy and she's going to give us an overview of different digital literacy programs that you could use to implement at university. So uh, before I pass over control to Jane and I'll disappear in the background, if there's any questions during the webinar, please just put them in the chat box at the, mo at the bottom and Jane will answer them either during the presentation if it fits in or at the end when we'll have time for questions. As I mentioned earlier, the slides will be available on the IFA website as well as a recording of this webinar. So can I now just ask Jane to join us, please, then I will disappear. Thanks. Great. Okay. Excellent. Hello, Jane. Hello. Okay, I'm going to disappear and let Jane get started. Okay, hello. Good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Jane Secker and welcome to the webinar today on digital literacy. Um, I'm going to um, talk to you um, at, at a sort of introductory level about what digital literacy is and from a sort of practical point of view based on the work I do at the London School of Economics where I'm the Copyright and Digital Literacy Advisor um, but also in my role as the Chair of the uh, SILIP Information Literacy Group which is the UK professional body for librarians and we have an information literacy group um, uh, special interest uh, network. So some of what I say really comes from the library world, although I'm talking about a term um, that might be um, new to you. So I'm going to say quite a bit about how digital literacy relates to um, literacies you might be more familiar with, such as information literacy. Um, okay, so um, uh, Romy has just sort of outlined some of the things that I'm going to cover. Um, and I think it's quite useful, although this is hopefully not too theoretical, this presentation, but just to have a look at some of the models and frameworks that exist about digital literacy and to think a bit about uh, what this term actually means, because it's, it's quite a, a contested term. And um, like some other terms, like, for example, information literacy, where we have very clear definitions um, and frameworks, uh, what you see with with digital literacy is that there are there are there's no one sort of framework that's dominating at the moment. There's lots of different ones out there, and we'll have a bit of a think about um, why digital and what might be different, and then hopefully look at some um, practical ways you can think about embedding digital literacy in your um, institution, in your organisation, and a few case studies that might give you some examples. Um, so main, mainly um, based on um, some examples I know from the UK, but it'd be great to hear about other examples people have. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start by just having a think about um, what the term might mean. So I've, I've got a couple of definitions um, up on the slide here. Um, and one of the definitions actually came from a report that was done about five or six years ago um, in the school sector in the UK and um, they started talking about digital literacy quite early on. Um, the the organisation um, was, was really sort of thinking what is it um, that young people particularly, they were thinking about um, uh, school age sort of children, what, what is it that they need um, to, to kind of function um, in, in, in the world and, and in society. And so they, they define digital literacy as a kind of a savviness so, uh, that, uh, that was basically allowing people to participate. And they used the word safely. There's quite a big emphasis in the school sector um, that digital literacy is quite a lot around um, sort of safety aspects and, and making sure when you're online that you're not vulnerable in any way, that you understand um, you know, who you should and shouldn't interact with. Um, so that was, that was a definition that's been around for quite some time. Um, at LSE, um, we came up with a definition 
um, uh, uh, probably about three or four years ago, um, where we were thinking about digital literacy um, and how it related to information literacy. So we actually um, bring the two terms together here. We see them as very interrelated and we see that digital literacy um, and we see them not just as skills but as knowledge and understanding and behaviours that are really sort of underpinning the ability to learn, to help people learn how to do research particularly um, but also to teach. So we have a definition that we use that's for staff and for students. Um, and um, obviously this is quite an academic sort of definition where we're thinking about the things that people need to be able to do when they when they when they're learning in higher education but also when they might be teaching as well um, if we move on um, so the the definition that I've been using quite a lot recently um, is one that's quite new a new definition from an organization um, in the UK called JISC they do uh, work um, in supporting the, the higher and the further education sector um, and they've had a model of digital literacy that they've been working on for a few years. Um, I'll show you that model um, in a moment but I, I find their def definition really um, quite helpful. They actually talk about digital literacies as capabilities um, but they're really emphasising that they're not just capabilities that we need for learning their capabilities for living, learning and working in a digital society. And then they give um, an example which I find quite helpful. So it's about the skills you might need to use tools when you're doing academic research, when you're writing um, and critical thinking. And um, this is the definition um, that when we asked some students at LSE to choose between three definitions, this is the one that they said actually um, was quite meaningful for them. So um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. But it's also, I think, really worth noting um, that if you, if you were to look up the term digital literacy and look for a definition, what you'll find is um, that there are many, many. And I'm by no means... Um, you know, giving you um, all the definitions out there. What I would say is that it is a term that if you use it with people, you should be quite clear how you're defining it. So you may need to explain that you what you don't mean, for example, because it could be quite easily um, confused with other terms. Um, we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, it's probably just worth um, sort of just for a bit of context. Um, there's been a lot um, in the UK, there's quite a, a strong government focus at the moment on um, what they have, have termed digital skills. Now that could or could not be the same thing as digital literacy, um, but um, it's kind of linked with the whole the, the digital economy. Uh, we had a report last year that was looking at digital skills for tomorrow's world. It was focusing um, particularly on um, what, what young people might need coming up through the school system and going out into the workplace, um, looking at the sort of skills that teachers might need to help support that as well. Um, and um, interestingly, the, this report used the term digital literacy and digital skills quite interchangeably. Um, and it was something when I responded to the author of the report, I sort of pointed out that, that actually nowhere did they have a really clear definition of what they meant. Um, and were they talking about computer literacy? Were they talking about um, learning how to code? Or were they talking about broader sort of literacies? Um, we also, um, in the UK, had a, a, a report um, in the House of Lords. Um, I've got links and you can follow these all up afterwards from the slides um, on digital skills again. And uh, the same thing, it's quite, quite linked to the idea of um, how to sort of enhance the UK economy, making sure that the workforce um, has got the kind of skills that they need and the capabilities. But again, a, another report that talked a lot about terms that weren't terribly well um, defined. We've also, um, and we've seen um, in schools, um, a, a big sort of push uh, talking about digital literacy in schools. Um, and a lot of the time that's actually been linked with the computing curriculum um, and a, a big move to encourage young people to learn how to code. Um, so a lot of UK schools have been um, setting up 
coding clubs so that um, with the idea that that this is going to be something really important for young people to understand how to do. Um, and I would just say there's a bit of a danger with equating digital literacy with, with, with coding, um, which is what's been happening in schools. And then interestingly in higher education, um, we, had, um, we have a body called the Quality Assurance Agency, so they look at standards in, in higher education uh, focusing on um, teaching, and they have announced that the reviews that they'll be doing um, in universities, um, one of the focuses is actually going to be digital literacy. So they're looking to see how digital literacy might be supported, embedded throughout universities when they review their teaching. So that has definitely generated um, a lot of interest um, in digital literacy in, in the UK. Um, one of the things, I'm not sure how well you can see this diagram, but um, when you look at the slides afterwards, um, you'll be able to, 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 to sort of follow this up. But I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about for quite some time is really how all these different literacies relate to each other. So this is um, a, a diagram I sort of put together really when I was thinking about where information literacy sits. Um, and I think um, while I'm not saying that um, there you know, there is just one sort of new, you might call it sort of meta-literacy or something that, that everyone needs. What, what you can see is that we have um, a kind of growth in um, talking about different types of literacies. So we've sort of gone beyond saying that people need to be able to read and write, they need to be, un they need to be able to um, understand um, information, um, they need to understand media. Now media and information literacy is the term that UNESCO use. They interestingly don't use um, digital literacy, so they have a curriculum and they've used the terms uh, media and information literacy put together. Um, I think this just really sort of shows you that, that um, sometimes people also in other disciplines, so particularly if we're thinking outside the library world, might well be thinking a lot about these new literacies, but because they come from a different uh, sort of fields, they, they may call them different things. And so I've had lots of really interesting conversations with other practitioners um, who I find um, might be using, for example, the term academic literacies to, to mean what I might call information literacy or digital literacy. Um, so just, just something um, to be thinking about um, when we're thinking about this idea of is 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 digital literacy actually um, something new? Is there something new about the technology that means all those things that we did before sort of don't apply or, or perhaps that we need some new um, literacies? So you could say, is, is technology here, is it a, is it a, a red herring really? Is it, is it actually that we just need lots and lots of abilities, one of which is to use technology, but by focusing specifically on digital literacy, perhaps we're giving it a bit too much weight. It's something we need to think about. Um, for many librarians, um, and I think many of the people tuning in here will be librarians, you may see that digital literacy is actually a subset of information literacy. Um, and that's certainly, um, in many ways, what my view would be. But I am quite aware when I talk to, to other colleagues who might be a learning technologist, an IT professional, that they might see things in a different way. And then I've certainly seen models that show information literacy as a kind of small subset of digital literacy, for example. Um, what I would say with that technology so we can say is it or isn't it a red herring certainly uh, when you use technology you there is a greater emphasis I think and the models we look at in a moment you'll see this on um, using technology to create content and to communicate as well and um, I think when you start creating and communicating there's a lot of ethical implications involved um, in a digital world. It's really easy to share content perhaps with people that you didn't mean to or that you shouldn't be sharing content with. It's easy to take other people's content, remix it, so you can you can quite easily get into uh, sort of practices that need quite a, a strong grounding in, in what the ethics are, what, what sort of the rules are around copyright for example, how you, how you acknowledge the work of other authors. So I think um, um, while in some ways the focus on, on technology might be perhaps overemphasizing that, that 
the world hasn't really changed. We're all doing the same sorts of things. We just also have technology as well. There are some aspects of technology that means um, perhaps we do need some new literacies. And I think that um, the term digital literacy often has um, quite a lot of resonance with, um, for example, when I deal with academic staff, I find I spent a long time talking to them about the term information literacy. Digital literacy sort of seems to have captured their attention a bit more. Um, they seem to be aware that young people having access to information on the internet um, has actually changed um, the way they use that information and they seem to sort of equate that very much with with digital so sometimes calling what I would say information literacy digital literacy can be quite useful I think also and as I say this was really not to get into too much of the theory behind digital literacy but there is quite a lot of reading um, which you can have a look at with the links at the end um, around um, what what digital actually does mean. Um, have a look at some of the sort of academic literature um, in this field and there is um, a sort of strong sense that, that technology um, really um, is something that matters because technology tends not to be just a neutral thing that's there. Technology is socially constructed. Um, technology also is an area where it causes quite a lot of anxiety, particularly amongst teachers and lecturers in their discipline. They will, some of them will have um, natural abilities where they're very comfortable using technology, others will not and they won't have a great deal of confidence and they will feel uh, quite concerned perhaps that they're lagging behind their students, that they're not the best people um, to, to teach them, you know, how to do something like um, to, to do a really effective search online to, to sort of find content. And that's again where um, the librarians with their sort of information literacy background can come in and, and help. Some of the, um, so, some of the um, issues as well with um, the term digital literacy is um, that it's sometimes seen as something, a bit like information literacy has in the past, that might Sit, sit alongside the curriculum and I think that's where um, it, it's really important to engage with, um, with teachers and um, also to make sure that we're teaching digital literacy integrated in the curriculum so in a way that's meaningful to students so that they don't become sort of disconnected with it so that they understand that we're not now just going to do the kind of IT classes we're learning to use technology as appropriate in uh, the discipline or the field that we're working in. So um, people working in medicine, um, people engineers will need to use technology um, to inform their work and they will have different practices. And so teaching that in the context of the discipline, so this is where obviously um, a librarian or a, a digital literacy specialist could work with a discipline teacher to really sort of make sure that, that, that this is actually embedded um, into the into the discipline um, and that kind of leads me on to this this um, sort of related idea so this I've called it the myth of the digital native so back in 2001 um, somebody called Mark Prensky um, he was uh, he he was he wrote about um, digital natives he talked about this idea of a new generation of people there's a lot of dispute about when this sort of started but it's kind of generally accepted that it's people born after the sort of mid 1990s so people who've been born um, after um, the advent of the World Wide Web and having sort of access um, to information via um, web browsers um, relatively easily. Um, this idea that these sort of digital natives have this um, innate ability to, to use technology you can see um, you can see in the picture here, I've got some young people with their iPads, with their smartphones. Um, you get a lot of people will talk about um, this idea that young people are very, very comfortable with, with uh, technology, that they, they sort of automatically know how to use it effectively. Now, I think um, there is quite a big difference between being familiar and comfortable with the technology, perhaps knowing how to use it to... Uh, in, a, in a sort of social setting and really being digitally literate and understanding how to use the technology 
um, in all aspects of your life and kind of considering the sort of wider implications. So much of Prensky's work's actually been largely sort of um, revised um, and this idea that there are sort of certain generations that are much, much better at sort of digital um, abilities than and the others has been discredited um, and there's been a lot of work so it's something I would consider that you have a look at if you're interested in, in the sort of background to that. It's also something to just kind of bear in mind so it, it, despite the, the fact that there's been a huge amount published in this field um, this idea particularly I find amongst um, discipline teachers that young people are very proficient and that there would be nothing that that they would be able to teach them um, does seem to pr prevail. Um, if we go on now, and um, what I'd like to do is just have a look at some of the models that exist about digital literacy. Um, one of the things I said at the start was that we have a lot of um, definitions that are out there about digital literacy. And similarly, there are many different models of digital literacy. So you can um, find a model really that, um, that you like and, um, uh, um, and use that to inform your work. The first model um, is the model that comes from the first definition that I used. Um, it comes, as I say, from the school sector. So Future Lab, um, we're looking at developing a model of digital literacy um, for, for schools thinking about how this could be embedded into the school curriculum, so for sort of under, under 18s. Um, and what you can see in this model, if you can see on the slides clearly enough, is um, that um, e-safety is one of the um, sort of aspects of digital literacy here. But for those of you who are librarians and familiar with information literacy models, you can see quite a number of um, familiar sort of elements here. So critical thinking and evaluation, something that's really important in information literacy. Um, we see it in a model of digital literacy. Similarly, the ability to find and select information, that's um, a really kind of important aspect in information literacy. This model um, recognises, as many of the others we're going to look at do, that functional skills are part of digital literacy. But I think what's really clear um, as well is that there are, there are many aspects to digital literacy and to equate it with computer skills would, um, would be largely sort of ina inaccurate. And it also in this model, I just wanted to emphasise, it's got a kind of cultural and social understanding which, which many of the other models um, also have as well. Um, this is a, another um, model of uh, digital literacy developed by um, Helen Beeson and Rona Sharp a few years ago. What I find um, really um, important about this model here, is, so it's a sort of pyramid shaped model, um, but it's kind of at the base of this um, model is the fact that obviously you need to have access and awareness. So digital literacy sort of, um, and I think in a sort of, uh, in other countries in the world where there's um, less um, good broadband networks, where maybe people are relying on, on mobile phones to get access to the internet, then obviously there's a certain um, sort of uh, a need to have access um, and then awareness of technologies um, before you can start to think about the sort of functional skills of being able to operate the computer um, and being able to sort of then build up your digital literacy skills from here. Um, I think what's also clear in this model um, is that at sort of the lower end of the digital literacy abilities were quite clear and um, they're quite well defined what, what those sort of abilities might be. And once you sort of move up the pyramid and it will depend quite a lot on the context that somebody's working on of what the sort of situated practices that they need are, what, what they're um, sort of feeling about their digital identity is. Um, so um, this, this sort of pyramid model um, is I think quite helpful of showing the way that digital literacy sort of builds, builds upon um, the kind of functional um, skills um, as we go up the spectrum. Um, this model, and I'm afraid this one is rather small so quite difficult to see, but this um, is the, the latest model from JISC um, who have uh, revised what they used to call digital literacy to a digital capability model. Um, what we see here 
are many different overlapping literacies. So again, apologies that the slides are quite small, but in the top left corner, we actually have um, information, data and media literacies. Um, we also um, have um, the kind of whole functional skills, so ITC proficiency, functional skills as being something really core to this model. So uh, presumably, you know, with, without those sort of functional abilities, um, you know, you, you would you'd really, um, you'd, you'd struggle to sort of build upon that and use tools um, effectively. Um, but the four aspects, I'll, I'll sort of go through them because um, I'm aware it's quite small. Um, so we've got um, information, data and media literacies. We also have um, what they call uh, digital learning and self-development. So that's an important aspect of digital capabilities in a higher education context, obviously. Um, but I think there is um, the ability um, using digital tools, you know, for us all to be learners. There's um, many resources that are available, many um, like open courses that we can take. And so self-development is a really important part of digital literacy. You know, we've, we've all been unable to do something and, and, and found that, great, we can go to the internet, we can have a look at a YouTube video, and that will teach us how to do something. So um, I think that's a really important part of digital literacy now, that, that we, can, we can kind of all carry on learning all the time. Communication, collaboration and participation, um, featured in uh, some of the other models we've looked at, really important um, aspect of, of digital literacy, and we can all um, use these tools, you know, to, to to host webinars uh, around the world that people can join, you know, to collaborate with people that we may not work um, in the same space. And there's all sorts of tools that are out there um, that you can use now that can really kind of break down the barriers of distance and enable people to work, you know, either in real time or, or to work sort of asynchronously using these tools and to, to, to participate in events. Um, and then finally, the, the aspect of digital creation, which is the top right, which I was talking about um, at the start, where I think this is where digital uh, really has sort of perhaps led to some new capabilities. We're all now um, using tools able to create content very easily. I was talking about taking other people's content, remixing, using other people's ideas. And so that's why I think we need um, a kind of a really solid understanding of the sort of ethical issues um, and issues around attribution and how we use other people's ideas. Really interestingly, around um, all these literacies, in this model, um, digital identity and well-being is really important. And I think it is something, when you go online, um, that, that is, is something I, that I certainly talk about with students quite a lot, about their online presence, their sort of, you know, what people find when they Google you, um, the ability for people to um, sort of almost create another identity um, online that um, you know that, that that may convey an accurate reflection of them it may convey something um, quite different and well-being as well that we all need some time uh, when we're perhaps not using digital technology um, finally um, I, I just thought I would highlight um, the work of Doug Belshaw who um, has um, many resources I put some further reading at the end that you might want to um, have a look at but he um, divides um, digital literacies into eight elements. You sort of see in many similar themes coming through in these models, but he looks at um, uh, uh, cultural, which is, is in some of the sort of cultural practices, co cognitive, constructivist, communicative, uh, we have confident, creative, critical and civic. So these are the sort of eight elements um, that he um, includes in um, digital literacy. What I think is really interesting with all these models is they're not lists of specific tools and technologies that you know how to use. So there's not a curriculum set out that says you will understand how to use, you know, particular um, tools like uh, Twitter or how to use, um, you know, elements of Google effectively. So these digital literacies are, are more sort of underpinning abilities um, that apply whatever tool we're going to use. And I think the idea that we're being critical of the technology that we use as well, so there's an element of, of really kind of thinking about 
which tool I'm going to use, which is appropriate here. Um, and I think confidence, which is something that um, is, is picked up in, in Doug's model, um, that's an area where it's, it's, it's really important um, in digital literacy. We know that people's confidence around te using technology does impact on their ability to actually use it. And I think um, confidence is, is an area where, particularly when you might talk to people in, um, in an, uh, in, with working as like a discipline teacher, they may really struggle feeling that they've perhaps not got the best digital literacy abilities. So we've looked at lots and lots of different um, models. Um, I thought I would share with you the model that I developed um, back four years ago in 2011. So I've been working, um, thinking about information literacy, working with um, Dr Emma Coonan, who's now at the University of East Anglia. And this is our model that we came up with when we were tasked with thinking about what were the, the kind of new literacies that students might need in the future. Now we've actually, we spent a lot of time deciding whether we were going to call this a digital literacy model or um, an information literacy model. And we felt um, that, that by focusing on technology it was um, not going to be the most helpful but also not going to make our model sustainable. So um, although our model is described as one of information literacy, it kind of came out a lot of work we've been doing to think about um, the new literacies that, that um, undergraduate students um, and those going through higher education might need. And again, some of the sort of aspects of other models you'll see, so we, we try to make our, our model, we see it as being very learner focused. So the learner is at the centre of the model, and we see that there are some fundamental key skills, some sort of functional skills that you need when you're developing aspects of um, information or digital literacies. Um, we then felt that um, it's really relevant to understand the context in which the student's working in, and so that these abilities are developed um, within, within a sort of subject discipline. And ultimately, um, what we saw we were trying to do was help our students become independent learners, have develop abilities so that, that you know, they could go on. I think we, we were trying to avoid this idea of seeing um, it as a, a checkbox of abilities that once somebody could do all these things, they would then be sort of competent. I think because the, the information and the sort of digital landscape is changing all the time, then one of the things that um, we need to equip learners with is this idea that, that their learning is going to be lifelong and is going to be continuous and that, you know, once they have learned how to do certain things, they're going, they're go that's going to evolve over time. Their tools will disappear. Um, so when we developed our curriculum, one of the things we were really clear that we didn't want to do was to put in prescriptive um, lists of, of tools that people could use. Now, I've got the, the link at the end if you'd like to find out a bit more about this, but I'm going to talk a bit about this model um, and how it was used in my own institution to kind of really review um, the, the work that we were doing um, around digital and information literacy. Um, and uh, there is, as I say, there's, there's far more on the website um, if, you want to, if you want to have a look at that afterwards. Um, I guess really what um, I wanted to sort of focus on a bit is when you're thinking about digital literacies is to just have a think about what you're kind of, where you're going, what, what, what your guiding principles are going to be here. Um, and I think really um, that, that what you want to do as I said um, when talking about our model, is to have learners who are, are lifelong learners who understand that, that they need to constantly be uh, evaluating their own skills, looking at new tools that are out there. Um, so some of the sort of um, things to sort of summarise really when thinking about digital literacy um, and some of the things hopefully looking at the models has helped you see is that there's many many overlaps with the term digital literacy and the terms information literacy and academic literacies. I think the other thing that I wanted to emphasize that when you're thinking about developing digital literacies to try to focus on those underpinning sort of abilities to focus on the cognitive 
abilities rather than the functional skills that you think students should be able to do. So we're not going to have a list where we say that students will be able to use Word and they'll be able to create certain types of charts in Excel. We're, we're thinking about um, the, the sort of the wider abilities that are transferable so they'll understand how to analyse data and use it and that may involve um, using you know some of some of the tools um, that exist at the moment but in the future there may be new tools out there that, that are suitable for analysing and presenting data. Um, also I think um, what's really clear at the different models that I've looked at is that digital literacy is not a sort of generic set of skills that apply across the board. So when you develop digital literacy sort of frameworks in your organisation, then it needs to be something that's appropriate for the context that you're working in. And I think that also you need to have some sort of flexibility to allow for differences in the disciplines. So a student who might be studying science and, or medicine will have quite different uh, sort of needs to somebody who's an arts and humanities student. And so be thinking about digital literacy all the time to try to relate it to the sort of the context that the students work in. Because I think otherwise it will just become a sort of uh, something that's 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 really not um, maintained by students. We want we want to kind of get to the underpinning abilities um, and and help them sort of transfer what they they learn as they go through their lives. Digital literacy, I think, is also, and I I, I think we um, hopefully by looking at these models we've seen this. It's not just functional skills, and it's definitely not coding. Um, although some people might think it is and some of your uh, students or some of your staff might decide that they do want to learn how to code. Um, but I've, I've just kind of listed out as I see it um, some of the sort of really um, the core things that I think that, that digital literacy covers um, in my view. So I think it's, it's a critical use of technology and um, by saying critical that's also sometimes saying that maybe it's, it's not even using technology if that's not the appropriate uh, tool. Uh, for the, the people that you're dealing with. It's, it's definitely um, about um, discernment and scepticism um, when they're handling information that they find online. So I think what you always want to be doing is in encouraging your students to not accept any information they find at face value, but particularly information that they find um, on the internet um, where it can be subject to all sorts of biases. So getting them to kind of really spend some time understanding you know when when a wikipedia article actually might be a very good source of information and when it isn't so identifying some of the sort of features that good online information has so it has authority it might have references um, it'll have lots of um, links to other places it will come from a credible organization and i think um, then something really important, which I've, I've mentioned a few times, is around ethics and, and getting um, uh, learners to understand the, the sort of the need um, to respect other people's work. So just because I can take other people's images off the internet doesn't mean I should do that without permission um, or without you know um, speaking to them first, without looking for content that's got an open license on it, for example. Um, and I think ethics is, is something that's really core to digital literacy. I also I think um, that you know there will be some focus on um, specific tools, um, but I think it's about um, getting students to think about um, how they can use them to communicate, to be creative, um, and to to collaborate and to do things that perhaps they couldn't do in a face-to-face -face setting. So using the technology to facilitate uh, sort of interactions, um, perhaps with people who you know are, are somewhere else in the world. And then um, the final sort of um, aspect of digital literacy that I think is really core cool is that is the areas around online identity. Um, what, what is on the internet about you, what you'd like to have on the internet about you, how you take control of that, thinking about your safety and um, well-being as well. So, so that's really um, a sort of summary um, of digital literacy. Um, and I'm going to go on and have a look quickly at how you can um, audit and review um, some of the, the sort of initiatives that might be going on um, in your own organisation. Because I think... Um, what's really worth sort of bearing in mind um, is 
that um, before you start doing any work in this sort of field, there's probably quite a lot going on um, at the moment. Um, so I think it's really important to have a think about um, how you're going to capture um, the current level of activity, um, where you want to be, so what, what, what sort of the aim and the overall vision is for a sort of digital literacy uh, project, who's motivating this, is it coming from senior managers, um, is it something um, that, that's coming from a sort of outside driver, um, so, so really be thinking about these things and then to be very clear about how you're going to define digital literacy, what framework or model you're going to use, um, who the stakeholders are and, and how um, at the end of this process you might measure um, any sort of success that you've had and the impact that you're having um, because it's always going to be really important to sort of see where you started out and where, where you end up. But I think um, the sort of the first phase really um, is going to be to, to thinking about starting with the framework um, and then to, to look at the different stakeholders within your organisation. I'm going to just say something briefly about the audit that we did um, at LSE um, a couple of years ago, um, but this is broadly speaking the sort of process that we went through. Um, we, we sort of uh, developed our own uh, digital literacy framework in a sort of collaborative way, um, working with a wide range of stakeholders from senior managers right down to also working particularly with students. Um, the methodology that we chose was actually um, a combination of a survey and an interviews to really find out what was going on um, and, and to reach as many people as possible. We found interviews while they were time consuming did actually give us a much richer picture of work that was going on and it helped to uh, qualify when people misunderstood perhaps what we were talking about. What we then did was mapped the activity that was going on to, to um, a framework and I'll show you that in a moment um, and we looked to sort of identify good practice, look at where there might be gaps and overlaps and then really saw that um, as an opportunity um, to, to enhance provision so we had a sort of baseline um, and there's a report listed um, in, um, uh, in the references at the end that you might want to have a look at that, that tells you a bit about the work that we did at the LSE. One of the main outputs that we had, so this is um, the framework that we were using, the um, ANSIL framework, a new curriculum for information literacy, um, and one of the things um, that we found um, through our review was that certain aspects of um, digital or information literacy, um, were, there were certain departments that had responsibility for this. So what you can see with the blue at the uh, bottom of the slide is that there were clear areas where, for example, the library um, had um, remit, particularly around helping people understand um, about the information sources that were out there, how they managed information, and around um, ethics. Um, there were other departments that had responsibility for uh, teaching around how to present and communicate um, information, um, and other departments, particularly our teaching and learning centre, who focused on helping uh, students become independent learners, develop academic writing abilities. Um, but we had quite a number of, of what I would say were sort of gaps, really, where we felt um, there's opportunities here where we realise that nobody is, is really teaching our students um, about issues to do with sort of online identity, um, how to use perhaps some of the sort of new apps and tools that were out there. We found um, that was a, a, a big gap, kind of, we were teaching students about note-taking, but we were teaching them about note-taking um, in a more sort of uh, analogue pen, pen and paper sort of way, rather than teaching them about uh, some of the technologies they might be able to use. Um, um, I think um, around how students made the transition into higher education and started to understand um, digital literacies and the abilities they need. We found lots and lots of different departments all trying to sort of almost compete for attention um, with students and, and perhaps the students might be getting quite a mixed message. But we found doing, carrying out a review before we started any work really, really valuable. Um, we also... Um, so this, this is really sort of um, informing um, the way we worked at LSE, but something that I think you might find helpful, um, 
that, that developing a strategy, working with senior managers and getting buy-in, what I've called a top-down approach, is really important. But there are alternatives um, that you might want to consider. So um, working with students, perhaps just deciding to work with one or two departments to understand the needs within those disciplines might be helpful. And um, the idea perhaps of sort of a, a ground um, a ground swell of movement through what you could call digital champions. Um, there's a lot of work um, that JISC have done through what they call their change agents network, which, which is the idea really that you have people within your organisation who understand about technology um, and, and kind of a sort of infiltrating. So it's, it's a sort of alternative approaches to getting digital literacy embedded. We found a combination of approaches, certainly um, having a strategy can be helpful, getting things passed at committees can be helpful, so getting sort of buy-in, but actually um, working with our students directly, um, as you'll see from the projects I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, has been really, really helpful. Um, and I mentioned the, the focus um, in the UK um, on the idea of working um, with students as, as partners and building a sort of what they call a change agents network. You can follow the links um, and have a look at this. Um, it, it's, it's been quite a big movement um, in the UK and quite a number of universities now have been working in this area. The slide, the image you can see is an event that um, LSE have been running with uh, UCL, so our the university but very close to us but with quite different um, students, teaching students in very different disciplines. We've all been organising what we've called the D London Digital Student Meetup. We're having our second meeting in November where students come along and talk about digital literacy and share experience with each other but also with staff as well. It really helps um, staff understand the actual needs of students for students, it can be very empowering to be part of a sort of a network to feel like that their voice is being heard in their institution. Um, and also what we find is that students sharing their experience with their peers is really powerful. So a student telling another student um, about um, an initiative or a tool that they're using is often going to be much more powerful um, than, than staff uh, teaching them about it. What we do find is that, um, that students do need quite a lot of guidance and support um, and structure, structure, particularly if you're setting up a sort of peer mentor scheme. So I'll say a bit about the project that we've got at LSE um, that's now in its third year that's um, very relevant to digital literacies. Our project is called Student Ambassadors for Digital Literacy. Very much came out of this work um, that I've been talking about to work with students um, as partners. You can have a look at the project website. We're currently recruiting for undergraduate students. We're looking to get 50 students from across the LSE to join us to act as a student ambassador for digital literacy. Um, the project really um, started as a way of understanding better what students' actual existing digital and information literacy abilities were um, so that we could support them better. So um, the students um, really um, we, we make it clear to them that, that this is a sort of two-way interaction. And although they come along to workshops, it's a very collaborative project and it's been led by Learning Technology, the library, um, and we've worked with our Teaching and Learning Centre and our Students' Union who've been very important. Um, we're really looking to improve the provision um, for students in the area of digital literacies but certainly three years ago when we started this programme, we didn't feel that just putting on lots of extra workshops in topics that we thought were interesting would be the most helpful way of doing this. Um, some of the approaches um, in this project, as I say, has been to rely um, on this idea of students providing peer support for others. Um, and um, we've, we've looked at four kind of key areas. So we've looked at finding and evaluating information where they look at tools like Google, Google Scholar, how they compare with, with other sort of academic search engines. We look at um, what we call sort of reading and academic practices and how they might use technology to facilitate those abilities, um, how the, the, the sort of apps that are out there that can help them, how they can cope with the amount of reading that they might be expected to do. 
Then we look at managing and sharing information. And finally, um, the, the area of managing your online identity. Um, the, the students you can see in the picture are actually some of our senior ambassadors. Um, these students have been through the program and then they're employed and they actually come in and help teach the workshops and they give us really valuable feedback um, on what they think is working, what they think is useful and they're also the way of promoting the project to their, their peers as well. Uh, just some outputs uh, from the project. Um, so in one of the workshops we asked students and interestingly, although we have technology in there, they spend quite a lot of time drawing and um, doing mind maps and using post-it notes. Um, they, this was when we asked students to think about how they use digital tools to manage and share information. So you can see that they were talking about the tools that they used, they were talking about different tools that might be good for sh storing information, things that might help them if you want to cite resources, um, and sharing ideas with each other. And um, they worked in groups on this and came up with some fantastic um, ideas and some you know, new tools that, that the people leading the workshops would often say, oh, tell us about that. We, you know, that, that sounds like a great tool. We haven't heard of that. This one was um, where we asked students about digital identity and their digital footprint and why they thought it might matter. So rather than us telling them why we thought it mattered, we said, why do you think it matters? Um, and they all came up with um, lots of really um, good ideas, um, obviously quite focused um, on thinking about their careers as well, thinking about employers, um, but we, we had some really interesting discussions here about um, ways that you could manage your digital identity, things that you could do, um, the, the ethics actually around you know, whether it was right um, to look somebody up on Google before you interviewed them or before you met them as well, that it might, you know, create a false impression of them. But then also uh, we had a student who became very aware, you know, that when, when they'd been Googled by a peer, um, that they had some things online that they didn't want there. So thinking about how to change some of your privacy settings, maybe delete um, some accounts that, that you'd forgotten about. Really, really interesting. And the evaluation has been really positive. So um, we've, got, um, we've got some feedback here from um, one of our students who really is sort of emphasising some of the things that, that they just wouldn't have known about um, if they hadn't been part of the programme. So we taught them a bit about open education, about creative commons and how to find images and um, we, um, we taught them um, about lots of different tools that might be out there that could help with doing research. And so this student who was uh, studying uh, statistics was sort of saying that this is something that really helped her in her studies. Um, but also students have said that this has been really useful uh, for putting on their CV when they go for jobs. And the benefit to our staff has been really significant as well. So the, the better understanding of undergraduate students, developing new approaches to our teaching, um, and lots, lots of things. One of our biggest challenges with this project is obviously we would like to teach um, all our undergraduates, but we have 4,500, so that's, that's too many really to get to come to workshops. And so the idea of building up the peer net network is really important to us in this project. I want to just highlight two other um, digital literacy projects before I finish, and I'm just aware of the time. So I'm going to move on, but if you'd like to know more about that project, then that's listed on the references at the end, as is the evaluation study that we completed um, in July this year. Um, another programme that I just thought is really interesting and worth you having a look at um, comes from my, my colleague um, Emma at the University of East Anglia, who I worked with. Um, they've developed um, at the University of East Anglia a digital scholar programme, they're calling it. Um, so they've got this rather um, amusing little cartoon that they're using to sort of say, you know, well, you can't Google your way to a degree, but actually some of the things... Um, that you learn in your Google brain actually might be quite helpful as well. Um, so, um, in, interesting approach. What they're looking to do um, is to develop this as an online program for all their students. So this is the way that they're um, dealing with the ability to reach large numbers. Um, but they're wanting to make sure that 
through this program it's it's not just a set of guides it's actually an opportunity for reflective learning um, they also have um, the elements of um, peer uh, support in here so they have evaluation and feedback from peers on different um, activities as well um, and um, if I can just sort of move on one of the things that this is really also trying to do similar to our program is to look um, at uh, digital sort of literacies in an academic environment but also things that might be useful when you go into the workplace as well. Um, it's linked to a sort of award that their students um, get um, if they do extra sort of curricular activities, the UEA Skills Award um, and the pilot of this project is actually starting pretty much about now so going to be really interested to see how this Digital Scholar program works. Unfortunately, because it's in their virtual learning environment, um, I'm not able to show you this one. But the next example I've got from um, the Open University is a fully um, open um, set of resources that you might want to have a look at. So this has been developed um, by um, colleagues at um, the Open University Library. Um, they have an information literacy team who've been doing a lot of work um, in the, the digital literacy sort of field as well. They call their course Being Digital and um, again it's an online program to support um, large numbers and it's looking at developing skills um, that are for study, for work and for lifelong learning. They um, have lots of short activities and now these are completely open um, to anyone who wants to have a look at these. Um, so I would encourage you to, to follow the links at the end and, and have a look um, at some of the activities that are there. Each activity is designed to sort of take no, no more than 10 minutes and it covers a really wide range um, of digital and information literacies and it's based on the Open University's digital and information literacy framework which um, I would encourage you to have a look at as well because that's another really um, good framework. Just to give you an idea some of the things it covers um, and you'll see lots of common threads coming through all these programs but it's about presenting yourself uh, online, managing your digital identity, making the most of online networks, so how you can use sort of networking to, to communicate, collaborate with people, um, knowing um, who and what to trust online, so a lot about um, this idea of evaluating sources, not just taking information at face value. Um, using Wikipedia effectively in your studies, when, when to use it, when not to use it, um, evaluating and using online tools and searching effectively. Um, it is actually many, many other topics covered in this um, programme as well, such as uh, keeping up to date. Um, there's quite a lot of really useful resources around uh, plagiarism as well. And um, so um, do, do have a look at this um, afterwards. I guess just sort of wrapping up because I'm aware of the time so I mean in, in conclusion um, hopefully you've got a really good idea um, of how digital literacy sort of relates um, to, to learning and to sort of living in a digital society. I think it's, it's something that is really key but I also think it's something that has a lot of overlaps with um, other types of literacies so um, it's something that's you, you should be aware um, might be you know might be something that many people in your organization have a have a, an interest in not not just uh, people in the library world definitely don't make any assumptions that students don't need this type of support and um, you know if you if you need to sort of counteract that idea there's lots of scholarly literature around the idea that digital na natives are a myth and that young people you know do need help to, to be discerning um, to, to be able to use tools effectively um, in an academic context and just because um, they might spend a lot of time on their mobile phone doesn't equate with, with digital literacy. To make sure that um, you're always trying to think about this in the way that you would with information literacy as being taught in context, embedded in the curriculum and something that is collaborative um, where you might want to work um, with other um, staff as well. So it's something where I think library staff have a really big role to play, but they want to be working with others. Um, and I think you want to be really clear um, how digital literacy fits into your organisational strategy. 
If you're a university and you have graduate attributes, it's something you might want to think about to make sure it's quite explicit there. And I would say, you know, good good luck um, in your in your digital literacy um, endeavours. I hope you found this useful. I'm around to take a few questions if anyone's got any, and we do have um, some links available um, here on the end of the slide. I think the the slides will be available to you afterwards if if you're interested. Um, in following up. So I think that's that's it from me um, and I'm happy to take questions. questions. Wow Dean, thank you so much, that was brilliant. I'm going to switch off again because the double audio is terrible so um, okay. Okay. I'll just wait and see if there's any questions in the chat box. Yep, yeah, okay, alright, that's fine. Yeah, so I'm um, here waiting, hopefully people found that useful. Okay, so somebody's um, asking me um, about a, a short questionnaire to learn what digital literacy level in my organization is so um, yeah there's um, I it probably isn't in the links that I've shared actually um, but um, I think what you probably want to do is have a look um, so in there there was um, a digital literacy survey that's been carried out in higher education in the UK by an organization called Usizer. Um, so I'll just, um, I think it's, it, this is how it's spelt, and it's uh, a sort of digital, I, I think it's called digital literacy, um, so, but there are a set of questions within this survey, I've just put it into the um, chat box, that, that they used to survey um, across higher education in the UK to sort of see what was going on. Um, other than that, um, we... Um, we didn't carry out a sort of survey of skills levels um, at LSE. It's, I think it's something um, that would be really useful to do, actually, and to also find out from people what it is that they want to, um, you know, want to be able to do, where, what are the sort of tools that, that they don't know how to use, what are the abilities that they had. So, um, I'll... I may well be able to, via uh, Romy, share some other links if I find a few things, but there's, yeah, I think, I think that would be something well worth doing um, as a sort of another way of benchmarking, you know, what, what abilities people have. I think what I would avoid doing is giving them a list of what are the tools that you want to learn about and to try to focus on the kind of underpinning digital literacy abilities. So is it that you want to use tools to communicate? Is it you want to use tools to collaborate and to focus on that? Hopefully that's, that's helpful um, because I think otherwise you'll just get a long list of people saying that they want to be able to create charts in Excel or something, which, which might be helpful to know that, but I think you, you probably want to go a bit beyond that as well and understand um, you know, what what are the kind of underpinning skills that people need help with. Okay, we've got some comments coming in, focusing on analogue methods to understand digital ways of working. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's really important and I would never sort of we, we actually have iPads available for students um, in, our, um, in our workshops that we run as part of the Saddle programme. And we tried to get students to put comments online using a tool called Padlet. And one of the things we found was um, that, that actually that sort of got in the way of students thinking and writing things down and um, sharing ideas. And it was far easier to give them large pieces of paper and a pen and um, it was it was much much more productive. So we sort of found that although students really like technology, they also really like um, flip chart paper. They like pens. They like stickers. They like lots and lots of things, um, sort of stationary things. So we've 
we've um, been investing in making sure we have lots and lots of um, paper actually in our digital literacy workshops, which may seem a bit counterintuitive. And the other thing that we definitely don't do in those workshops is run them in a computer room. We actually want students sitting around tables talking to each other and then if, if they need technology we will have some um, laptops available but we, we do not run these in, in computer training rooms. So we, we want the focus to be on, on talking and sharing ideas and technology to just sort of be part of that rather than rows of students sitting sitting staring at a screen. I would somebody has said that they would like to avoid the psychological barriers from older staff members. I think yeah, I think that I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's, it's not always older staff members, but sometimes um, I would say that that staff can be quite resistant um, to trying out new things, particularly um, in their teaching. They they have sort of tried and tested ways that they know work, and um, it's just something um, that that you know you you really I think you you have to sort of build people's confidence up quite sort of gradually here. Um, encouraging them to sort of try out new technologies um, is always something where you know you're going to run into to people who are quite fearful of doing that or might have tried to do something in the past um, and had it go wrong. Um, we certainly have this when we we encourage staff to use something for example um, like voting systems, electronic voting systems in teaching and we've had a few instances where it goes wrong and it, it will put the member of staff off ever trying to do it again. Um, so sometimes that is around actually just having somebody um, you know, there in the classroom with them to give them a bit more confidence. There's actually a, a scheme at the University of Southampton called DigiChamps where they employ students to go in and help staff um, in the classroom with, with these kind of um, technology sort of um, issues and to give them you know a, um, a bit of support so the students there um, you know if, if they run into problems when they're using technology and that's actually um, been really uh, successful so that's University of Southampton DigiChamps. If there's no more questions then um, I will sign off um, I'd like to Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much, Jane. Thanks for, her, for okay. taking the time to do this. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop broadcasting now. Um, okay. Bye.